It's a joy and delight to welcome you again this morning in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, here to St. John's on this soon-to-be warmer day. Bright, it's bright, sunny. The day is good. God is good. But here's the thing. So this is not your typical Lutheran way to start off a sermon, but I want to ask you a question. So you can either kind of, in a casual way, put your hand up or in your mind answer this question. And being as I'm probably one of the few guys from New England, so like the northeast of the United States at the seminary, we just have to do things different. It's just how it works. But here's the question. Out here today amongst you all, do we have anybody who's sitting here who is a master expert Facebook news feed scroller? I'm going to put my hand down because it's certainly not me. But anybody with that talent here? I'm not going to call you up here, but you get to skip out on that. But anyway, so... What do we see? What do we think? If you've ever been on Facebook, I'm guessing most of you have seen it or been on it, but you got this thing you can kind of scroll up and down on, and now on Facebook, it's less of your family, your friends, maybe some people you don't even know who you are, but they sent you a friend request. But it's a lot of ads, it's a lot of random group things that pop up on this news feed thing. But there always is someone, every time it is that I am going to preach somewhere, there's always someone, whether I know them or not, or some company or something that posts something that finds its way into one of my sermons. So luckily today, somebody graciously did that for me. So what did the person post? They write, here it is. They write, money will not fix all your problems. So as you can imagine, that piped everybody up. I got everybody all fired up. And there's a bunch of comments related to this is something that I agree with, this is something that I disagree with, this is something I don't know what to think about this. And I'm sure there's probably been times in your life and times in my own life where you felt this statement, money will not fix all your problems, is either true, it's false, or you just don't know what to think about that. Sometimes it's one or the other. So in the comment sections of this post, the usual drama, the usual discourse, the usual people battling back and forth on social media, not sure what it is that they're doing all day, but they just keep going on this comment thing. But somebody writes. This is what they respond with. No offense, but money would solve little, literally every single one of my problems. If someone came and dropped off, this little leprechaun man came and dropped off his pot of gold on my front doorstep, or the local bank in Defiance, whoever you guys have here, came and dropped off wads of $100 bills at your front door, that this would literally solve every single one of their problems, like all of them. And this person could not think of any single problem that money would not solve for them. But here's the thing that they don't get. Here's the thing that they do not understand in posting this. This is not how it works when it comes to Salvation. This is not how it works when it comes to the forgiveness of sins, which is what the church is about. The church is about the forgiveness of sins. This is not how God works. You cannot buy God by dropping off a check at his doorstep for $10,000 or even $10, $10 million, whatever. You cannot buy your forgiveness. We cannot pull out our checkbook. We cannot do these things. And we cannot pay God to let have him let us into heaven. But here's the fact. A text like this, as we have recorded and given to us in the lectionary this morning from Mark's gospel, frequently serves to do two things. Well, one, to jar, and second, to annoy a culture, and probably if we're truly honest ourselves, a culture that is materialistic, is focused and highly focused on things that are material. And this includes you, and this also includes the guy standing up here in the pulpit in all black with a white collar on. And the fact is that most congregants do not want to hear sermons that make them uncomfortable about their material or monetary possessions. So two, pastors a lot of times want to avoid talking about stewardship, want to avoid passages such as this that bring up this subject because their congregations expect them to set the example. And as we know, pastors are poor, miserable sinners, just like the rest of us. But looking at the text, we can see reasons why one would try to cover up, one would try to kind of dismiss 
what it is that Jesus is actually saying, what it is that he is telling the disciples and those who are listening in this text. Simply put, people just don't like it. So as a result of that, various attempts have been made over the years to discredit, to dismiss the law here in this text, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And it's so important, Jesus repeats it again. But these various attempts have been made to, disc to discredit or really even to dismiss this bullet of the law that comes to you, comes to me, to convict us of our sin, that we would turn from our sin and see Christ crucified for us. So one way people do this is they try to soothe consciences and by assuming that when Jesus says those who are rich or those who have wealth, that he's talking about someone else. He's really not talking about us. He's talking about whoever it might be. Someone who has maybe a little more money than we do. Someone who makes $1,000 a year more than us or 10000 or twenty or 50000 or who has people that are so kind and give them all these things, but somebody else gives them more. But the fact is, we always try to imagine that we fall below this kind of, if I was to put an imaginary line here in front of the pulpit, this imaginary line, we always fall beneath this line for what's considered wealth. Or we fall behind this and under this trust in your riches line so that we can comfort ourselves by saying that, well, you know what, Jesus meant this message for somebody else. He didn't mean it for me. Look at all the wonderful stuff I do for the church here in Defiance. Look for all the things I do for the church abroad, whatever the case may be. Or you think, you know what, this isn't for me. This is for the neighbor who lives down the road from me, who's got the new riding lawnmower that picks up all the leaves that keep falling down from the tree. And here I am pushing this old Toro that blows smoke out the side every time you start the thing up. This passage, too, has also been subject to this kind of way of clever doctoring and clever maneuvering around of what Jesus is saying that make his later words, especially when he's talking about the camel and the eye of the needle, as we heard in the children's message this morning, take these words and simply seeks to do what? Either reduce the size of the camel so it can go through the eye of the needle or to enlarge the needle's eye itself. And therefore, the lesson from the text would become something that is practical, and it would be this. Those who trust in their riches need not worry if they're just what? Well, if they're just humble. If they kneel down like a camel, maybe they can go through the eye of the needle if it's a little bigger. They need not worry if they're kind. They need not worry if they're compassionate, if they're empathetic. Whatever the adjective is that you want to put in there, that is one way that people try to dismiss what the text is saying. But here's the fact. One should always be suspicious. Each of us should always be suspicious of any kind of expounding or explaining a text that seems to soften Jesus' preaching of the law, that you and I are sinners, and preaching on how we are justified before God by grace, through faith, for the sake of Christ. And if one can say that after we're, we've read this reading, we've heard it read when we read the Holy Gospel, and we heard it read again at the start of this sermon, if one can say, after encountering Jesus' teaching here on wealth, well, you know what, all these things and more I have kept since I was a boy, then you know what? That means that we deserve a big old pat on our shoulders. We can kind of dust off some of the dust. And you know what? We're looking pretty good. And it also means that you can skip out on like the first 10, 15 minutes of the church service and skip the confession and absolution, or as we have it today, what we call the declaration of grace because I'm not ordained. But you can skip out on that and can come later on when the readings show up because you wouldn't have a need for confession. But that's simply a wrong view of this text. But here's how it works. We need to hear Jesus' comments on wealth. We need to hear Jesus' teaching on wealth. And these really kind of strike our conscience as kind of disturbing because it convicts us as a sinner. When he says, how difficult it would be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's because he casts a spotlight on our everyday sinful values as a spotlight from eternity's angle of vision. 
And from that perspective, those who make money, they're God. Those who make wealth, they're God. And God with a lowercase g, not a capital G in English. But make money, they're God. And trust in themselves and their wealth and their riches, however little or much it is that they have, and think that's the way that they are going to get into heaven by something they have or something that they have done by any kind of good work. It's not how it works. Jesus is the one who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He is the way to the Father. Jesus is the truth, the one, the only truth, the one who comes to bring knowledge of salvation in his name, and the one who comes to bring life, the forgiveness of sins that he gives us through his death on the cross, and life eternal, which we look forward to on the last day as we confess in the creed. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. But Jesus tells us exactly what it is that each of us needs to hear, even if it's not what we want to hear, even if it's not what we think Jesus would say, even if it's not the things that kind of like perk our ears up and you get to say, well, you know what, Seminary Wendelowski, you're doing a pretty good job. No. He tells us what it is that we need to hear. And he's not saying that he rejects having possessions. That's not what he's saying. Many of his first followers had possessions. Somebody obviously owned the houses where Jesus retreated with his disciples. It's just how it works. But the central issue that Mark's gospel deals with this day is who is one's God? And how is it that we are saved? Simply not of our own accord, not of something that we've done, but for the sake of Christ who was crucified for us. The same Christ who rose from the dead, the Christ who ascended into heaven, the Christ who will return again on the last day. But the reality is that in this sinful fallen world, money, well, it really does a lot of things for people. What happens? Such as what? Such as honor, such as respect, such as admiration, such as power, such as beauty, such as sex, such as all kinds of things you could add to this list, which is why it is that it makes wealth and money so alluring. But let us learn this day from the text. The immense danger of the love of money and the love of making money and wealth into a god with a lowercase g. And that any notion of our riches, that which we have, that which God has given to us to use for his glory and for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that those who are outside the church would hear the good news, repent of their sins, and be welcomed in as dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Any notion that it is something that we do that gets us into heaven is simply incorrect. And it's sad to say this, but nonetheless, it's true that on the last day alone will fully prove how true these words that Jesus speaks are. As we head to the end of October, as we head to the end of November, we approach the end of what we call the church year. So a lot of the readings, we get the text about the virgins and their lamps, and in, I think, year one, we have the text where Jesus comes as judge and he separates the sheep on his right from the goats on his left. And so it'll be that on the last day, this text will fully prove how true that the words Jesus spoke are. So therefore, let us watch, it's my prayer this day, let us watch against the love of money. For it's not so much the having of money as it is the trusting, the relying in the money instead of in God, God our Heavenly Father. It's that which ruins the soul. So let us pray for contentment with such things that we have, such things that God has given to us, including our faith that's been given to us by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And so too, let us echo the words of St. Paul when he writes this, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Here again this day, these words recorded by St. Mark. Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. In Jesus' name, amen. 
The peace of God which passes all understanding, guard and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.